Right. Um, so, my name is Sean Fitzgerald. I'm uh, managing director and co-founder of Breathing Buildings. The, the company uh, was set up in 2006 on the back of a research program uh, funded by BP. And just in terms of um, big, big lessons learned, um, in terms of BP's involvement with A, the research program, and B, uh, our company, is that you know, if BP, you saw the seven businesses that didn't quite make it, uh, they, they didn't make it for BP. That doesn't mean to say that the seven businesses were dogs, all right? It's just that it didn't fit with the three lenses, which were the priorities on how they select. Because BP is a company with limited resources. We're all limited resources. And you need to figure out which are the ones you are, you are best to go and chase because you, for example, have got the right core capabilities. And Breathing Buildings is a good example. I hope you're, I'm going to convince you. As a business, you know, it's a fantastic business. But in terms of, is it a business that BP should be going into, you know, building ventilation? I think not. You know, and that's the lessons learned by uh, them being involved. And you can do two things. With BP, you can go and commission a management consulting research uh, uh, project for about three months, spend X hundred thousand dollars figuring out whether this is a business that's uh, going to be good for BP or not. Or, and this was actually a very smart thing that BP did, was you go and invest in a business. Actually, you get more than three months exposure. It doesn't go out of date. Actually, you can go for a ride for a few years and actually make a really informed decision as to whether the business is right for you. And actually, you will make more than 300, you won't lose $300,000 on a management consulting report. You'll actually end up making money through the research exercise itself. Anyway, so it was a very clever thing that BP did. So why, why are we in town? Um, just take, just be very quiet for a moment and just listen. Now, what you're listening there is a mechanically ventilated building shundering away, okay, with fans. And if you look at the energy consumption of a building that is naturally ventilated, and you compare that with the energy consumption of a building that is not, like this one, all right, mechanically ventilated air conditioning, you will find that, generally speaking, there is a factor of two difference in the energy consumption. Now, that sounds pretty fantastic. And when I tell you that buildings account for 50% of the energy consumption of the developed world, and you see a factor of two difference between an air-conditioned building and a naturally ventilated building, you'll start to see some very big numbers that become quite appealing. So my question to you is this. By the way, I don't do rhetorical questions, and this is going to be interactive from now. My question to you is, what are the problems? Why do people like, or why do you think people like, buildings that are mechanically ventilated and air-conditioned versus ones that are naturally ventilated? So hands up, I'm going to ask you questions. Why don't you like naturally ventilated buildings? Architect's problem. Architect's problem. Like the architects in okay, the architects love the ones on the right, yeah? Architects tell me the buildings need to be narrow if they're naturally ventilated. Uh, narrower, okay. Any others? Noise. Noise. <coughs> I, I, I grant you, it's all relative and you kept, okay, so noise. Any others? Fear of the unknown. That's why we're here. Anyway, I, I will definitely, you're quite right. Yes? Okay, six days in summer when it's a bit warm. So that's fine. So we're going to, this is the pr this is the price for your six day bet. I'm very happy to accept the argument. Yes? It's an old building and it's got, it's the way it is. Right, okay. So there are old buildings versus new buildings. Yes? Natural ventilation doesn't work. And what do you mean by that? In theory, it's naturally ventilated. You boil in the summer and you freeze in the winter. I love it, I love it. Can I bring them on? So you're boiling hot, you're boiling hot in the summer, you're freezing cold in the winter, and I'll tell you you're probably in a building where you asphyxiate in the winter because they don't ventilate it either. So it's stuffy and horrible. That's probably enough, all right? So this is why BP decided to go and get into a research program to find out what you can do that's different with these buildings. So the first thing is that in winter, all right. If you're freezing cold in winter, there are two things that you need to do. The first thing is, believe it or not, you need to insulate the building, not rocket science. And unfortunately, you know, it's teaching grandmothers to suck eggs. If the first thing that you do is insulate the building, guess what the second thing is? Insulate it again, all right, because you do the boring stuff first. And then once you have made the building actually thermally appropriate in terms of it's well insulated, you now have a problem with trying to keep you from asphyxiating in the winter. And the problem is this, if you use a strategy which uses a radiator to preheat the incoming air, so 
bear in mind I've done an awesome job, Mr. Architect's done an awesome job at insulating the building. We have a problem because if you bring the air in at cold level, in the winter it's too cold. You said it was too cold. So the old solution was to bring the air in over a radiator. And I'm going to, apologies for any Americans in the, in the audience, I'm going to use SI units, not English units, imperial units that is. So minimum temperature for inlet. I don't know, 15 degrees C. Some people are generous. Some architects say, no, it's got to come in at 18 degrees C. The problem is this. If you bring in the minimum level of air that you need to stop the CO2 levels going sky high and meet part F, that's one of the building regulations, 10 litres per second per person. If you bring in enough air to give you fresh air in the room and you preheat it to 15 degrees C and you have now insulated the building properly, what will happen is you have an airstream coming across a heat load. I can see a few people sweltering in this darling room, all right? And we are a bit warm. We've got this on, we've got all of your heat, and you're all kicking off about the same heat as an old 100 watt light bulb. You run the numbers and you'll find you've got kilowatts of heat being generated in this space, <laughs> and then you've got the lighting load. So guess what? If you bring in air already heated to 15 degrees C, and you pass it over that heat load, the poor chums on the back of the room are gonna be sweating buckets. So now you have a problem that we've got overheating here in the winter because you're preheating the air through via a radiator and the solution is to bring in more than minimum ventilation to stop these guys getting too hot. So that skinny little radiator on the wall has now grown into a great big monster to preheat multiples of your air coming in. And it's doomsday, which is why that heating element on the old way of naturally ventilating, bu naturally ventilating buildings is rubbish. OK? And so please don't do it. I think you'd have got the message by now. What we decided to do was to do, after the architect had be built a decent building, you now have a furnace. Nearly every non-domestic building being built today, and that includes refurbishment ones, OK? There are challenges with the architectural form of using the technology. But once you are going to do any building work, you need to meet the building regulations, which means you have a good level of insulation. That is a furnace. And the first thing to, to do is to recognise it's a furnace. The second thing to do is to use it. So what we did through the University of Cambridge um, research programme funded by BP was to say we have the opportunity of a heat source here and instead of using a radiator to preheat the incoming air, we're just going to mix the incoming cold air in winter with enough of the hot air in the space to stop there being cold drafts. Now, in a school classroom, you've got 30 children. And clearly, I could use one of, this is 100 years ago, imagine it was a well-insulated building, I could use one of the children to stand on the desk with their exercise book and as the cold air is coming in, use a book to do like this and to break up the incoming cold plume of cold air and mix it with the hot interior air. 100 years later on, today, we're not allowed to do that, child labour laws. So we actually have technology that does this instead. Okay, this is the big idea and we filed it as a patent through the University of Cambridge and it's been granted in Canada and it's about to be granted as I understand it in the EU. It's still pending in the EU and the US. So, what do we do in the summer? Now, It's a, right, there is a, there's a, the, the hole in the roof, okay, is sized so that in summer you can open the window, get the fresh air coming in at 15 to 18 degrees C. I'll come on to the point when it's too hot outside, bringing enough of this hot air to go out. So this is a hole that's sized to do summer ventilation. But in winter, you only open it part way and you regulate it so that the uh, degree of natural mixing, you put it into this chamber, and we use the old punker fans, all right? Punker fans are called destratification fans. They're not to drive a ventilation flow. They are there to break up an incoming cold plume. So they're stupidly low wattage. 45 watts is the maximum I can get the power consumption. That is my ventilation system in winter to disrupt the incoming cold air. That's what it is. In summer, we use this strategy. And as a company, we had this big idea, and the really important thing about, a, about making a commercial success is the, fir the first thing is to make sure you have an awesome team. An awesome team who A, understands the technology, and B, just might understand life in terms of how to go and run a business, etc. And the second thing is actually the, the, to have the team, you need to have some backing to go and tr try and get a good idea. We have one good idea and a team. So, our team, and the, sort of the, the one thing that we do, and we just continue to major on, is that we understand 
energy and fluid flows, air flows in buildings. That in itself generates wild and wacky ideas. The idea I've just shared with you is the first. There are others in the pipeline. So once you've got a wild idea, we actually went out and talked to architects, engineers, people who design buildings to try and get an understanding of, well, would you, would you take this technology? Would you use it? That, how would you do it? What are the constraints? Which led us to design the product. Product development went on for about a period of six weeks, uh, six months. We decided to start with that we were going to run solo, building the business, only because it was the most viable way of getting access to the market rapidly. That doesn't mean to say that running solo you know, is the end game. It's what we were doing at that stage. That then led to sales. Sales then leads to buildings going up with the technology. And that, then that leaves us with an opportunity or gives us an opportunity to get data about the technology, which we then use, bring it back to the team, and we're learning more and more about how buildings work. In other words, what are the problems with asphyxiation in some of the buildings we didn't actually go and um, sort of put the technology in. Sometimes I'll do half a building and the other half of the building is mechanically ventilated. Just a fantastic test bed for us to go and pour in data and understand what we need to do to get the whole building to work. That leads to more wild ideas and so the cycle continues. Right, in terms of the technology. So the technology involves a variable control damper, in other words, closing off part of the hole in winter and two of these low energy fans to just to go and break up incoming cold plumes. What does the data do? Well, because we've sized the hole to be big enough in summer and we understand about the heat absorptive capacity of the building itself, we are now building buildings where they are designed to meet certain criteria. So when it's hot outside, can you create an interior that's cooler? And in, this is uh, data from a school in Nottinghamshire, Beaver High School, the building standards were as follows. We had to design the school classroom so that there were not more than 120 hours above 28 degrees C. For those of you who think that's just too hot, I'm sorry. All right, that's what the regulations say. But what we do, actually, we way outperform this because we had zero hours in 2010 above 28 degrees C. So I'm sorry that regulations aren't in your favour. We most certainly are. So in terms of thermal performance, because we understand thermal mass in buildings, we control the natural ventilation system to maximise the benefits of night cooling. In terms of air quality, we make sure that throughout the winter, you do not exceed your daily average CO2 levels in the space, which are 1,500 parts per million in a classroom and about 1,000 parts per million in an office. We make sure you do not exceed this because if it's a controlled natural ventilation system, we regulate the aperture at high level to make sure you've got the right amount of air coming through. In terms of energy use, we are dramatically lower than the benchmarks being tabulated in the various guides within the, indi within the industry. The way that they measure energy consumption is in kilowatt hours per square metre per year. That's a typical practice secondary school, and these are the schools that I've actually happened to have many, uh, got the readings from so far. We've been around since 2006. Uh, this school here has been up and running for five years. Some of them have got slightly higher IT loads, therefore um, slightly different circumstances. But the energy consumptions are about a factor of two lower than the standard benchmarks which we're supposed to be meeting. If you don't believe me, and hopefully you do, but if you don't, I would just invite you to come to any one, pro any one of our projects. And it's not just educational buildings. They, these are educational buildings. You know, this one's a spaceship, it looks like. And it landed in um, the northeast uh, coast. So this is uh, Monks Eaton High School, a 22 million pound school, many awards, and our ventilation system controls that. But we've got an Asda supermarket. We've got a theater. Um, we've got loads of educational buildings, about 50 around the country now. In terms of sample projects, you know, throughout the, throughout the year. So we started delivering actually in 2006 was our first commercial project, but it's ballooning right now as the, as the architects are now realising they're no longer guinea pigs. The technology is out there, tried and tested, and they want to go and change the world by looking at the energy consumption that I've referred to earlier. And in terms of our future, well, I mentioned that the business model today, at the beginning was to go standalone. Well, actually, to really make an impact in the, in, in the built environment, we are not going to do that alone because the, the, the uh, cycle for a building is about two years from concept to actually it coming out of the ground because you've got the design process, the tendering process. So we're actually working with other players in the industry. And what is pretty, what is pre pretty revolutionary is that we've decided to team up with, quote, the enemy. 
all right, with a mechanical ventilation company. They've teamed up with the enemy too. They've teamed up with us, natural ventilation companies. Why? Because we both see that the vision is to transform the built environment and have a company or companies able to provide the whole ventilation system. Because there are certain parts of a building that will always be mechanically ventilated. The toilets, the bathrooms, the kitchens, they're always going to be mechanically ventilated. There are certain landlocked rooms that will be desperately hard. Back to your architectural form, uh, question. Some room forms are very, very hard to make to be naturally ventilated. Theoretically, you could do it. But pragmatically, you'll probably end up wanting to mechanically ventilate 20% of the building and naturally ventilate 80% of it. That will be the right solution for the builder. We're moving into beyond education, so the sector expansion, we're moving heavily into retail and we're looking at healthcare as well. Overseas, we're now looking at different business models overseas because we're based in Cambridge. We're not going to make equipment in Cambridge and ship it to Australia. It'll be working to set up manufacturing facilities in Australia or in the US or in Europe. How are we going to do that? We're going to do that with others. Teach, and it's going to be the same model, working with mechanical ventilation companies in these target markets and just saying, we love what you do, you're just making the wrong stuff. So make this equipment, add it to your portfolio, and then you will, enable to, you will be in charge of transforming the built environment in your particular ge geography. We continue to innovate by collecting data from the buildings that we have already installed equipment to. That leads to more product development, more product wild ideas, and then hence we take it back, and so the cycle continues. So that was all I was going to share with you about breathing buildings. If you've got any buildings, we'd love to hear from you, clearly.